Today, I want to speak to you on this false doctrine that is going around uh, telling people, especially that is posing the father and son line screen, telling people that the Bible says that we should not call anyone father. So the whole purpose of me presenting this uh, message to you today is to deal with our position to the new wine scheme that we are seeing God has instituted of fathers and sons and that is being so strongly opposed by many, many religious mindsets <coughs> Excuse me. in the church today. Usually the point of view opposing the wine skin of fathers and sons are coming from people that use the scripture from Matthew 23. Now, I think just for completeness sake, let's have a look at what this portion of scripture actually says. If we go to Matthew 23, verse 6 to, to 12. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version. It says from verse 6, And they have take pleasure in and thus love the place of honor and feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, and to be greeted with honor in the marketplaces, and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi or teacher, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And then comes the very verse that they use in verse 9. And it says, Do not call anyone in the church on earth father, for you have one father who is in heaven. And you must be called masters or leaders, for you have one master and leader, the Christ. He who is greatest amongst you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself with haughtiness and empty pride shall be humbled, brought low. And whoever humbles himself, whoever has a modest opinion of himself and believes accordingly, shall be raised to honor. Many in the body of Christ today quote this scripture to support their charge that the present apostolic wine scheme of father and son is unbiblical. In addition to this, they vehemently deny the use of the term father for any human being. An examination of the scripture proves that the use of the term father was not restricted to God only. We can see that biological fathers in Scripture were called father. If we look at Genesis 27, oh sorry, 22 verse 7, and I'm reading from the Amplified Version, it says, And Isaac said to Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And Isaac said, See, here are the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt sacrifice? Here we see clearly Isaac called his father, father. If we continue in Genesis 27 verse 34, uh, and we read there, it says, When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with a great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, my father. Here we see Esau calling his father, father. Another scripture that I can look at is in Genesis 48, verse 18, and it said, And Joseph said, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put your right hand upon his head. So we can see in scripture that natural fathers were called father. Then we also find that there were special relationships in scripture in which people called others father. The first one that I want to present to you is Elisha and Elijah, because Elijah here we see were called 
father by Elisha. And just to give you the scripture, in 2 Kings 13 verse 14, and I read from the Amplified, it says, Now Elisha previously had become ill of the illness of which he died. And Jehoash, king of Israel, came down to him and wept over him and said, O oh my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen of it. Here we see Jehoash cried over him and called him father. If you continue further, we see that Job was a father to the poor. In Job 29, verse 16, it says, I was a father to the poor and the needy. The cause of him I did not know, I searched out. If we look at Isaiah, we see that Eliakim was installed as a father. And let me just read the scripture for you. It's in Isaiah 22, verse 20 to 21, it says, and in that day I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and bind your gold on him and will commit your authority to his hand. Now listen to what it says in the last portion. It says, He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. If we look at Genesis chapter 45, we see that Joseph was a father to Pharaoh. Verse 8 of Genesis 45 said, So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh, and Lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Another aspect of this whole thing being called father is that we also find in Scripture that patriarchs were called fathers. The first one that I can point out to you is that of Abraham. If we look at Acts 7 verse 2, it says, And he answered, Brethren and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our forefather Abraham when he was still in Mesopotamia before he went to live in Haran. Here we see that Stephen called Abraham father. <clears throat> If we look at Romans chapter 4, verse 1, we see that Paul here calls Abraham father. Uh, let me just read the scripture. But if so, what should we say about Abraham, our forefather, humanly speaking? What did he find out? How does this affect his position? And what was gained by him? Again, we see him calling father. Romans 4, verse 12, as well as that he made the father of those circumcised persons who are not merely circumcised, but also walk in the way of that faith. Now look at what it says. Which our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. If we look at the New Testament in the, the, the book of Luke, we see that the rich man called Abraham father. Uh, we read it in uh, chapter 16 of Luke and verses 24 to 25. And he cried out and said, Father Abram, have pity and mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abram said, Child, remember that you are in your lifetime, fully received what is due you in comforts and delights. And Lazarus in like manner in the discomforts and distresses, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. You all know this parable. But we see here that the rich man called Abraham, Father Abraham. In Luke 16, verse 30, we see this conversation continue. And the rich man answered, and it says here, yeah. but he answered, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent, they will change their minds for the better, and hardly amend their ways with abhorrence of their past sins. We see this rich man again calling Abraham father. <clears throat> the most amazing thing as well is that we see that Jesus actually also called Abraham father. In John 8 verse 56 it says, Your father, forefather Abraham was extremely happy in the hope and prospect of seeing my day, my incarnation. And he did see it and was delighted. 
Again, here we see in John, Jesus calling Abraham his father. Now, if we look at Isaac, we see that he was also called father. In Romans 9, verse 10 to 11, it says there, and not only that, but this too, Rebecca conceived two sons under exactly the same circumstances by our forefather Isaac. And the children were yet unborn and had so far done nothing after good or evil. Even so, in order, in order further to carry out God's purpose of selection, election, and choice, which depends not on works of what men can do, but on him who calls. And here we see in Romans, Paul calling Isaac, father. Now, <clears throat> if we study the scriptures further, we see that Jacob was also called father. We see that also in the New Testament, where the Samaritan woman called Jacob father. We read it in John 4 verse 12. And it says, are you greater than or superior to our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well and who used to drink from it, it is so, and his sons and his cattle also? So we see that here the Samaritan woman calls Jacob father. Now let's move on to another aspect, and that is, let's have a look at the spiritual fathering that we see in the New Testament. In 1 Peter 5, verse 13 and 14, we see that Peter calls Mark his son. Let's read it. She, in your sister church here in Babylon, who is elect and chosen with your soul, sends you greetings, and so does my son, Mark. Salute one another with a kiss of love. To all of you that are in Christ Jesus the Messiah, may there be peace and every kind of peace and blessing, especially peace with God and freedom from fears, agitating passions and moral conflicts. Amen. So be it. Here we see Peter calling Mark his son. We also know that Paul claimed himself to be a spiritual father. And we read it in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15 and 16 says, after all, though, though you should have 10,000 teachers in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. And then he makes the statement and he says, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the glad tidings of the gospel. So I urge and implore you, be imitators of me. We find in scripture several references of Paul and Timothy. And here we see in 1 Timothy 1, verse 2, Paul writes to Timothy and he says to him, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, spiritual blessing and favor, mercy and peace be yours from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Again, we see in verse 18 to 20, calling Timothy, my son. Let me read it. This charge and opposition admonition I commit and trust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with prophetic intimations which I formerly received concerning you so that inspired and aided by them you may wage the good warfare. Here we see, again, Paul calling Timothy, my son. So if we move on to the second letter of Timothy, we see in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, again, Paul calls Timothy, my beloved son. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, favor, and spiritual blessing, mercy, and heart peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then in 2 Timothy 2 verse 1, it says, So you, my son, be strong. Strengthen inwardly in the grace that is to be found only in Christ Jesus. Then we see later on Paul and Titus. In Titus 1 verse 4, Paul says, To Titus, my true child, according to a common faith, grace, spiritual blessing, and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see Paul calling all these sons. And then there's another one. And that is Paul and Anisimus in 
Philemon 1 verse 10 and 11. And yeah, we know that Onesimus was a slave, but he calls him his son. I appeal to you for my own spiritual son Onesimus, meaning prophet, whom I have begotten in the faith while a captive in this church. Once he was unprofitable to you, but now he is indeed profitable to you as well as to me. If we look at John, we see that John also saw himself as a father to those that he was shepherding. In 1 John 2 verse 1, he says, My little children, I write to you these things so that you may not violate God's Lord's sake. You see, again, we see John calling himself a father to those he was shepherding. We see also that John wrote to the fathers that were in his congregation. In 1 John 2 verse 13, he says, I'm writing to you fathers because you have come to know, recognize, be aware of, and understand him who has existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have been victorious over the wicked one. I write to you, boys, because you have come to know, recognize, and beware. Be aware of the Father. So if we look at all of this, we see that Father was used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, both in the context of having a biological oversight or spiritual oversight. So having laid that foundation, let us now go and look at this scripture in Matthew and ask ourselves the question, what is it then that Jesus was actually saying? So when we go and look at the context of Matthew 23, you will find that it's all about the Pharisees. Jesus was chastising the Pharisee. Why? because they were using titular authority in order to assert superiority over the people and then assume authority over them. You see, the sad thing is the Pharisee could not serve the grace of Father to the people. You see, in Matthew 23, verse 11, Jesus clearly said, He who is the greatest amongst you shall be your servant. So we see here that Jesus was strongly criticizing this whole thing of titular authority. And this must not be seen in a literal context, but figuratively as usurping the fatherhood of God. The chief president or he's also called the Nazi, of the Sanhedrin was called Prince, and the Vice President, Father of the Court, Ab Bedin. Jesus was alluding to this hierarchical and titular structure of the Sanhedrin that usurped authority over the people, stole the honor that was due to God and deceive the people into having an extraordinary and high opinion of the Pharisees and the scribes that robbed them of their dependence upon the Lord. Jesus was using the format of what we call a hyperbole or an exaggeration to highlight the high-mindedness and the cult status of the Pharisees. And they had now added to the law and were operating not as representatives of the Heavenly Father, but placed themselves as being equal to God by forming their own laws and asserting dominion over the people. If you read the scripture, it also seems in that portion of scripture that is also prohibiting the use of the word teacher. But then in scripture we see that he also appointed his disciples to teach. So the same principles apply. In Matthew 28, 
verse 18 to 20, we see Jesus approached and breaking the silence said to them, All authority, all power of rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go then and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion, to the very close and consummation of this age. Amen. So let it be. We see also that the scripture tells us that he gave us teachers in Ephesians 4 verse 11 and it says here and his gifts were varied he himself appointed and gave men to us some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors and teachers so we see here, God gave us teachers we also see that Paul himself was appointed as a teacher. These appointments are made by Christ himself. Therefore, we must understand that his chastisement must not be taken literally, but figuratively differently, as a criticism of titular authority that misrepresent the Heavenly Father. So the issue here is that the Pharisees were misrepresenting God, and thus it was wrong to call them Father. He is not denying earthly fathers. He was stating that God the Father has no equals and stands alone as Father in heaven. The use of the term Father for the set man with us, or the pastor of the household must be seen in the sense that he represents the Heavenly Father, but not being equal to the Heavenly Father. Our true Father is God in Heaven, and all aspects of fatherhood comes from Him. You need to understand that you can call the leader of the household that you belong to, whatever both in you, both you and that person, are comfortable with, but recognize that through his words that he carries, the doctrine that that leader carries, grace is delivered to you. It is the word that he delivers that fathers you. You see, the word father means nourishment. And we see that Jesus told Peter to feed my sheep nourish my sheep, and Peter fathered the flock by feeding the flock. It is my prayer that with what I share with you today, that it will bring about a clear understanding of this whole concept of calling no man your father. It has been taken out of context. So if you go and apply the scriptural principles of scripture interpretation, the rules for scriptural interpretation, you will find that all that I've shared with you today is true. So it's my prayer that you will be blessed and uh, that you will enjoy a wonderful relationship as you receive grace from that one that God has placed in your life as a nourisher and as a father. God bless you and great grace to you and